Good morning, Father Nathan. Hi, yeah, Sammy. Just about to make you the host. Okay. You'll actually send us into breakouts today. Mm-hmm. Here's Mary Dial. Looking good. Oh, and there are the Hudsons, and they've Oh, it looked like you had a split screen. It's just that behind you, there's a, a wall. <laughs> I thought you'd done something techie for a second there. Hi, Father. And there's Jean-Marie and Susie. Here comes Kathleen. All right, if, uh, if it's quiet where you are, uh, feel free to un mute yourself while we do our little morning prayer. And I'm gonna get us started with a, an opening prayer and then uh, invite you to uh, invite anyone else you might like to have along today. Okay, does that work for you, Sammy? Okay, all right. We pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please take a few deep breaths. Recall that every breath, whether you're conscious of it or not, is spiration, respiration, spirit of the living God who brought us into being, continuing to bless us with the ability to draw breath. We ask Holy Spirit that you surround us with um, peace and security. We call on St. Michael the Archangel to stand guard over us, guard over us and keep us safe. We invite Holy Mary and St. Joseph to be with us today in all of the places where we're located. We call on Paulus, St. Paul of Tarsus, whom we're particularly focused on in this study. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for being with us. I call on uh, St. Dominic, St. Francis, St. Mary Magdalene, St. Rose. I'd like to invite all of the um, holy ones who either by name or, um, or in a crowd, any who are in the scenes that we'll study today, we invite you to be with us. We call upon uh, the members of our own family lines that are in the light and who might like to accompany us today. Please come and be with us. I'd like to invite um, all those who down through the centuries of our faith have devoted themselves to the study of scripture and helped us to uh, understand much of what we'll be doing today is built on the shoulders of others who preceded us in explaining things. Are there any that you would like to invite by name? If so, just say their name either aloud or in your heart of hearts. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Thank you, Jerome. St. Gerard and St. Teresa of Avila. St. Joan of Arc. We ask Holy Spirit that you uh, stir within our, our consciousness and our imagination and our intellect. Open us up and help us set aside every other a demand on our time, every bit of unfinished business, anything that might cross our minds that would not be helpful for the time that we're applying ourselves to this study. We want to give you as much space as we can. Uh, help us also to be receptive to a word that you might have for us individually, depending upon the current events and life circumstances of our own. And please be with any who today are in special need of your care. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. All righty. Um, 
uh, I'm, I'm watching the, um, the number of views that the posted previous sessions are getting on YouTube. And it looks like a lot of you that haven't been able to join in person are going online and keeping up. That's what it looks like anyway. Although there are also people that uh, haven't signed up for this study who are accessing it, which is also a beautiful thing. Um, but I'm, I'm very pleased that Joe is getting them posted pretty quickly and that it seems like they're no sooner up there than somebody's looking at them, which is the whole point. Um, let, let's just, uh, for any who weren't here or were, were here before, do you have any thoughts on uh, what we did last time or anything that you'd just like to say for the common good uh, to this point? Just wanna give you a chance to sound off a bit if you like. Well, I'll say something and no one else will. I can always count on you, Michael. Okay. What do you got? Well, I, I, I told my wife, Linda, about the Hopkins Park story. Oh, yeah. Which is a fascinating story, and I did some research online or whatever, but the, the point I'm making is that a little story like that is a great way to maybe solidify the point that you're making at the time that you're making. You know, people love to hear stories and they can relate to stories. And, and I just encourage you to continue doing that. Sure. Well, thanks. Uh, uh, do you, do you want to, for people who don't know what you're talking about, can you summarize that story? <laughs> now you're, well, you, you're, you're, you're all about telling stories. Story. So tell us the story about what you're talking about. Cause not everybody knows. I don't think I'm looking, um, well, I'm looking at several people who probably don't know what that is. But, uh, uh, give me a thumbs up if you don't know what he's talking about. There you go. Kathleen Morgan doesn't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I don't know. I'd love to hear it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Actually, the best way to hear it is, is to go to the online YouTube and get it from the horse's mouth. Well, you could do that too. Uh, yeah, okay. But, but in essence, it, it is the passage that you were reading has had to do with with uh, with someone spontaneously being asked uh, to express their views on something, and and as the story you told told the story about when you were a young seminarian and and uh, and you had an opportunity to go to Hopkins Park, Illinois, which is about an hour south of Chicago, one of the poorest areas, actually in the nation, not just Illinois. And it's and it's and it's encumbered history revolves around, I guess, in the twenties and thirties when Chicago, the Chicago House of Ear, Ill Recruit saga had their pimps send pregnant women to Hopkins. Park to have their babies. Some of them went afterwards went back to Chicago and some didn't. Some stayed there. And and many end up staying there. And it, I think Father said it's it's it, it's a very matriarchal community, Hopkins Park, because of just of its history. And Father was there because there was a charismatic priest at, the, at a Catholic church that 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 a lot of people resonated with and 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 this priest was very good at, at acclimating these ladies to the word of God through his preaching. And, and uh, that became a signature of these ladies in the community. And then Father was talking about attending mass one day. And, and this is when he's only been a seminarian for five months. And, and someone says, says uh, I think you weren't called Nathan back then. You were Rob, right? That's right. And they asked Rob to say a few words. And so, so, you know, you did. You didn't say exactly what you said. But the idea that when you're called upon spontaneously, when any of us are called upon spontaneously, to say a few words to, to elucidate our understanding and beliefs in something, we should be willing to do that and trust that the Holy Spirit will be there assisting us. So that's my take on it. Okay, well that that's uh, that's well done. The the um, the thing that was that m made that story pertinent 
for me is I felt I was so ill-equipped to stand up in a mass and preach. I'd never done it before until I was asked. And I was asked on the spot with no opportunity to prepare. And I did it because I was asked. It reminded me of the fact that we're used to seeing these characters that populate the Acts of the Apostles. Peter is going to show up again. And I just keep trying to remind myself that they were subsistence fishermen. They weren't orators. They weren't theologians. They were just people trying to do the next thing they felt the Holy Spirit was calling upon them to do. And that's a, a lifestyle that I've enjoyed for 65 years, even though I've been in campus ministry a lot of times and there are repetitive tasks that are familiar. But I, I've, throughout my life, I've been thrust into circumstances and situations where I find myself doing what I've never done before and, and oftentimes needing to do it in front of other people as a leader. And so anyway, I, uh, that Kathleen, uh, that was... <laughs> That was a little story from my long ago past. Thank you for, for relating it, Michael. Well, I'm going to move us along today. I, at the end of the last session, I told you I was going to take us into the text of First Corinthians, but don't believe a word I say, because we're not going to do that. We're going to go through several chapters today, and instead of First Corinthians, we're going to go to First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians is, is, is the the very first document that we have that is now in our New Testament that's bound together in your Bible. It's, it's generally written by Paul. It's the first thing that we think of that he wrote, but I'm going to get us there by moving us through chapters 14, 15, 16, and half, halfway into 17 today. So the first part of, the, of today's session, probably about 40 minutes or so, is largely straight reading from Acts the Apostles with a little bit of commentary and following along. So um, for now, it's probably best that you mute. But um, if, if during this, if, if there's a, you have a question or a comment, uh, feel free to unmute and uh, call my attention. But for right now, we're going to start at chapter 14. We're in what's called the first of, uh, of, of four missionary journeys of Paul. If you recall, he left from Antioch by boat and... Um, he went to the island of Cyprus, to a couple of places there, uh, preaches in the synagogues. Then he goes uh, north of that to the mainland, to what we would call Turkey, Asia Minor. He was, uh, he was from there on the, um, on the far eastern end of, uh, of what we would think of as Turkey. But anyway, he was not all that far from home, uh, which is kind of the way you would start out. Um, with something unfamiliar, you kind of go to a place that you might have some familiarity with. And as we've seen, and what we've done up to now, their first strategy is usually find wherever the Jewish community is there, and there are Jewish communities in a lot of places, there'd be a Jewish, Jewish section of town, where there would be a synagogue, because they were Jews, they would be welcome at the synagogue, they would go there. And then when they were invited, they would speak, and Paul in particular, would try to show them with his mastery of uh, the academic tradition that he had been schooled in, he, would, he could take them all through uh, their, the law and the prophets and show them predictions about the Messiah, characteristics of who the Messiah might be, describe uh, scenes from the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth and lead to the conclusion that, see, it is him. He is the long awaited one. That was pretty much the flow of, of his technique and style. Sometimes that was received with joy and um, a change of heart, change of mind. Other times it was uh, met with resistance and even violence. So anyway, we're at the beginning of chapter 14 right now. And we're up, we're not along the seacoast now. He's gone inland from the sea and in, uh, in Asia Minor to Iconium. In Iconium, likewise, they entered a Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way as to convince a good number of Jews and Greeks. So there would be Greeks in a synagogue that would be, um, Paul himself was a mixture. His father was not a Jew, but his mother was. So he spoke both Hebrew and Greek. He had one foot in kind of Roman uh, authority culture. He had another foot squarely in Jewish culture, and he was planning to be so immersed in Jewish scholarship as to be one of the bright lights of his time. But anyway, there's this mixture of people even in the synagogue. 
but he used but the but the text of Acts the Apostles often uses the the word the phrase the Jews to talk about the most um, entrenched in kind of an, uh, traditional ways of thinking. Those of you that were around for the study of John's gospel, everybody in the story is a Jew, but then we, we keep hearing of, of a group of people called the Jews. The Jews did this or that. In both John and in Acts the Apostles, sometimes that phrase gets used to mean ones who were most resistant to the idea of Jesus of Nazareth being the Messiah. Anyway, the Jews remain unconvinced. They stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there and spoke out fearlessly in complete reliance on the Lord. He, for his part, confirmed the message with his grace and caused signs and wonders to be done at their hands. Most of the townspeople were divided over them, some siding with the Jews, other with the apostles. A move was made by the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to abuse and stone them. When Paul and Barnabas learned of this, they fled to the Lyconian towns of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to proclaim the good news. Again, this all gets, all this activity gets collapsed into one paragraph, but it's just roiling with all kinds of energy. You have have them coming in from out of town, coming into the synagogue, uh, explaining, teaching, preaching. You've got some people excited about it, others very disturbed about it. Um, and, and then it says, the Lord himself confirmed the message with, with his grace and caused signs and wonders to be done at their hands, but it doesn't tell us what those were. Signs and wonders, were they healings? Um, Signs and wonders, some sort of, um, of supernatural signs or experiences of some kind, we're not told. But it, like the, the, the author is saying, not only did the preachers do their job, but the Holy Spirit comes along and does signs and wonders. Uh, most of the townspeople were divided, some siding with one and some siding the other. But a group gets together and decides to abuse and stone uh, Paul and Barnabas. They learn about it and uh, they flee to the next town where they continue to proclaim the good news. Well, again, it, as you pray this, and if you want to slow it down and, and sit with it, you might want to think about, my heavens, have I ever been in any such circumstance? Have I ever tried just to be a bearer of good news? Uh, a servant, um, one doing what I think I'm called and supposed to do, and found that it got such a mixed reaction. It has a kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't quality about it. There's no way that you're going to be able to go into a place and control the, the reaction of everyone else to what you have to say. I had to learn that early as a preacher, that very often in a Catholic setting in Dominican parishes, we'll, we'll designate one pr uh, preacher for the whole weekend. So you have a Saturday night mass, several in the morning on Sunday, and maybe one or two Sunday night. They have different character in terms of the kind of people that show up at them, the age groups that come to them, the kind of music they prefer. Uh, uh, and, and sometimes you would have something challenging to say that would be welcomed by some, and then you'd have other people in your face on the, the church steps or, you know, you can't run around from person to person to person and please everybody necessarily. And that was certainly the case here. Not only were they displeasing, but they were threatened with their life. They were stoned, but they keep moving. They go to the next place. At Lystra, there was a man who was lame from birth. He used to sit crippled, never having walked in his life. On one occasion, he was listening to Paul preaching and Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had the faith to be saved. He called out to him in a loud voice and said, stand up on your feet. The man jumped up and began to walk around. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they cried out in Lyconian, gods have come to us in the form of men. And they named Barnabas Zeus. And they called Paul 
Hermes, since he was the spokesperson. Even the priest of the temple of Zeus, which stood outside the town, brought oxen and garlands to the gates because he wished to offer sacrifice to them with the crowds. So doesn't it make you dizzy? You know, only a few sentences earlier, they had done pretty much the same thing in the adjacent town and they were, <laughs> were going to be killed for it. They do the next thing in the next town over and they are called Zeus and Hermes and the guy in charge of the temple is bringing them oxen and garlands. They're going to have to say, it. we're not really gods, it's just us, which is, is what they're going to say right now. When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their garments and they rushed into, out into the crowd. Friends, why do you do this? They shouted frantically, we're only men, human like you. We're bringing you the good news that will convert you from just such foolishness as this to the living God, the one who made heaven and earth, the seas and all that's in them. In the past ages, he let the Gentiles go their way. That's how Paul understood it. That the Jews were still God's chosen people and the Gentiles, God just let them go their way, whatever that meant to Paul. Yet in bestowing his benefits, he has not hidden himself completely without a clue. From the heavens, he sends down rain and rich harvests. Your spirits, he fills with food and delight. In other words, you know, God uh, sends rain on the just and the unjust. Yes, it might be true that God has this chosen people, but he also sends rain to the other ones. And they have fields too, and they get taken care of. Yet even with a speech such as this, they could scarcely stop the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. They wanted to like build a little altar or put candles at their feet or kneel and say prayers to them or something like that. Have you ever had anybody do that? Anybody ever made you the object of their, uh, of their worship? No, Michael, nobody's ever done that to you? Um, no, you never had adoring fans, Jean-Marie? Uh, wanted to put a light a candle at your feet? Well, that happened to Paul and Barnabas, and they had to tell these people, stop it. <laughs> we're, just, we're just guys like you. But he could, they could hardly stop them. But just at that point, some Jews from Antioch and Iconium arrived, and they won the people over. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the town. Well, this time they just didn't threaten stoning. They're actually throwing stones at him, and they dragged him out of the town, leaving him there for dead. It, that had to hurt. And chances are uh, this kind of treatment, this is this still their first missionary journey, one of four, and Paul eventually does die a martyr's death. But this kind of thing would probably be cumulative, wouldn't it? That, that's going to leave a bruise. Um, uh, I would think that over time it got harder and harder to do this, but nevertheless, uh, they stone and drag him, leaving him there for dead. The disciples quickly form a circle around him. Before long, he got up and he went back into the town where he had just been stoned. The next day, he left with Barnabas for Derba. After they had proclaimed the good news in that town and made numerous disciples, they retraced their steps to Lystra and Iconium first, where they just had been, and then to Antioch. They gave their disciples reassurances and encouraged them to persevere in the faith with this instruction. We must undergo many trials if we are to enter into the reign of God. He's, they've, they've come and they planted a seed, but they can't stand there and watch it grow. They've got other things to do, but they try to give some encouragement. And one of the ways that they encourage is to say, don't let this get you down when you have persecution and so on. Uh, they probably referred to the life of Jesus where he had plenty of opposition, not just on Good Friday, but long before that. Anyway, they, um, they encouraged them and said, we all have to undergo trials if we're enter into the reign of God. But in each church, they installed presbyters and with prayer and fasting, commended them to the Lord in whom they had put their faith. So, in the Catholic, uh, the, the word presbyter often gets translated as elders. Sometimes it gets translated as priest. And in the, in the Catholic church, I am a presbyter. Uh, the Presbyterian church is built around that same word, but the idea of that part of the reform uh, back at, at the time of the Reformation was that everybody is a priest that the priesthood of all believers connect God to or heaven and earth or connect the sacred and, and the uh, profane or whatever. Um, but 
they're, they're, it's the first time this word gets used in Acts of the Apostles. There is beginning to be a need for some elders in the community to at least oversee the, uh, the breaking of the bread, what we might call the mass. So, but they, in each church, they installed presbyters and with prayer and fasting, commended them to the Lord in whom they had put their faith. So they did that with prayer and fasting. They didn't just pick whoever was handy necessarily. They did some sort of discernment about who they thought uh, would be good. This was obviously a difficult circumstance to live in and to leave in. Anyway, that they then passed through Pisidia and come to Pamphylia. After preaching the message in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had first been commended to the favor of God for the task that they had completed. On their arrival, they called the congregation together. They related all that God had helped them accomplish and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Then they spent some time there with the disciples. So they've made this full circle. They're back in Antioch where this mission had started. This was the group of people who had sent them out to begin with. Now they're coming back with a report. Uh, and it seems like the thing that they're most excited, you know, you might have done a lot of things on your vacation or since the last time we saw you, but there's going to be a headline. Kathleen, what was the biggest thing? What was the most important thing that happened or whatever? And the headline is God is opening the doors wide to the Gentiles. When we didn't necessarily see that coming. Uh, that there, one of the issues in the life of Paul is, as I mentioned on Thursday, it was one thing for a mostly ethnically Jewish group of people with kosher laws and circumcision and memories of the temple and, and all of that to welcome a few God fearers. They had always done that. But then, then this business of Jesus being the Messiah, it begins to attract more and more people that pay no attention to any of that who and probably don't even care very much about it. That begins to kind of throw off the equilibrium that, of the community. On the one hand, they're excited about it. But if you're from um, in this older uh, Jewish Christian part of the community who is used to feeling in the majority, it can be disconcerting when you the numbers are shifting and you don't look like you're in the majority anymore or you're not going to be for very long. That was one of the things that's just a sociological point. It doesn't have to have to do with theology. When one group of people begins to move from majority to minority, that can throw things off. Sometimes that's ethnically. Uh, sometimes it can be a gender balance thing, especially when men are used to running things and then there are more women around than there are men. Or the elders are used to running things, but they're beginning to be more young ones than old ones. Or a linguistic thing or economic thing. Anytime that there's some sort of movement sociologically that shifts the balance, you can expect there's going to be some fallout. But for right now, at least at the end of this, uh, at the end of chapter 14, uh, it seemed like the news that they brought home was well received and they spent some time there. Now in chapter 15, they, there, there's this, this equilibrium, this, this potential disunity is gonna be the theme of this chapter. Some men came down to Antioch from Judea and they began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the Mosaic practice, you cannot be saved. You must become more like us if you are gonna be one of us. This created dissension and much controversy between them and Paul and Barnabas. Finally, it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some others should go up to see the apostles and presbyters in Jerusalem about this question. So Paul and Barnabas, are going to go to headquarters, if you will, in Jerusalem, and we're going to have a conversation about this. It's, you're not just going to send us a delegation to, to tell us what to do and to boss us around. Uh, it's important that the dignity of everybody in the community be acknowledged and accepted, and the fact that you have some authority, that's fine, but it doesn't mean that you're simply because you deliver an edict, it's the last word. So Paul and Barnabas are not spoiling for a fight, but they are insisting upon a conversation. So they travel uh, to Jerusalem and uh, the, it says the church saw them off 
they made their way through Phoenicia and Samaria, telling everyone about the conversion of the Gentiles as they went. So again, the conversion of the Gentiles is theme one. It's the headline. Oh my God, who, who saw this coming? Their story caused great joy among the brothers. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by that church, as well as by the apostles and presbyters to whom they had reported all that God had helped them accomplish. Some of the converted Pharisees then got up and demanded that such Gentiles be circumcised and told to keep the Mosaic law. It goes on and on. If you remember, there were two parties within the, the, um, the Judaism of Jesus' day, two principal parties, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees were much, they were wealthier. They were kind of the old royal families or whatever, the, the, uh, the old guard. Uh, they were very invested in the temple priesthood. They had homes around the temple. Uh, in fact, some of them have been excavated and are available for tourists now. Um, and uh, especially because they had a lot of pools. They were very big on the necessity of ritual washings before you could perform sacrifices. And so pools are usually made into um, uh, basements and uh, when buildings are torn down, the pool is still there. So even though a lot of the buildings are gone, we can see the foundations of them, which include all these washing stations that the, that the Sadducees used. The Pharisees were already the more liberal party of those two, but even they're having trouble with the Gentiles and saying, nope, if you're gonna be one of us, you need to be circumcised and told to keep the Mosaic law. So the apostles and presbyters accordingly convened to look into the matter after much discussion, Peter takes the floor. Peter, who of course is a lifelong Jew. Brothers, you know well enough that from the early days, God selected me from your number to be the one from whom, whose lips the Gentiles would hear the message of the gospel and believe. God, who reads the hearts of men, showed them his approval by granting the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. And that was a very compelling argument in the early church. When the Holy Spirit would come upon people, it wasn't just an interior warmth or sense of peace or something like that. It was electric. And it was outside. It was tongue speaking. It was miracle working, um, speaking in foreign languages that they'd never studied. Um, stuff that everyone could observe right there and plain as the nose on your face. Peter is saying, you saw it happen. Um, God who reads the hearts of men showed his approval by granting the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between them and us, but purified their hearts by means of faith too. Why then do you put God to the test by trying to place on the shoulders of these converts a yoke which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? Our belief is rather that we were saved by the favor of the Lord Jesus, and so are they. Now, at this, the whole assembly fell silent. So, you ever been in an assembly that fell silent? Not just polite silence, but profound silence, where they have just heard something spoken so truly. Um, could have been out of the mouth of babes. Somebody just says something so true that a silence falls over everybody. That's what happens here because Peter, of what Peter just said, what we just heard. The whole assembly fell silent. Then they listened to Barnabas and Paul as the two described all the signs and wonders God had worked among the Gentiles through them. When they concluded their presentation, James spoke up and said, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has told you how God first concerned himself with taking from among the Gentiles a people to bear his name. The words of the prophets agree with this, where it says in scripture, and of course now he's quoting old uh, Jewish Old Testament scripture, Hereafter, I will return and rebuild the fallen hut of David. From its ruins, I will rebuild it and set it up again, so that all the rest of mankind and all the nations that bear my name may seek out the Lord. Thus says the Lord who accomplishes these things known to him from of old. It is my judgment, therefore, that we ought not to cause God's Gentile converts any difficulties. So Judaism always had 
a universalist component, a universalist strand, particularly in the writings of um, the prophet Isaiah, uh, that all the nations will stream to Jerusalem. They'll see a people living in such harmony and such love uh, with, a, with a law that their God had given them uh, and people living in harmony between heaven and earth with all that is, that everybody around them would want some of that. And all the nations would stream toward Jerusalem and say, what nation has a God such as your God? We want what you've got. That always belonged, and that's why we have the three kings in the story of, uh, in, in the birth of Christ story in Matthew. Matthew's always trying to show Jesus is the, the new Moses, because he's trying, he's still working with this same struggle to help older Jewish folk understand that this new movement isn't a fly-by-night religion of the month. It's, it's, the, it's God acting consistently over time, but God also um, bringing newness to the fore or taking something that was always there, but making it front and center in our awareness. It's now time for the Gentiles to be accepted, not just as a footnote off to the side, but as central to God's activity. God is doing a new thing and uniting us in a way that we're not used to being united. Anyway, um, James says, uh, we should merely, uh, it's my judgment therefore that we ought not to cause God's Gentile converts any difficulties. We should merely write to them to abstain from anything contaminated by idols. This is bullet points, that would be one. No, abstain from anything contaminated by idols, from illicit sexual union, from the meat of strangled animals, and from eating blood. After all, for generations now, Moses has been proclaimed in every town and has been around in, in synagogues on every Sabbath. So what they're doing is, or oh, James is doing in that part, is um, laying out a compromise. Compromise is one of my favorite words. Do you know it? Co and com mean with. Pro means to be in favor of or for, before. And misa is mission. It's the word we use for mass, mission. So uh, to, to be a person who can compromise is one who is with for the mission. Unfortunately, in our contemporary politics, we often hear the word compromise used as a negative somebody of our party, our tribe, compromised with the other side, uh, and so they should be voted out of office. We, everybody should stay in their row, in their silo, and do battle with the other kind. That's not what compromise means. It's exactly the opposite of what it means. The word means to be together for the mission, and it presumes to be together with people who uh, are not your normal playmates, not in your you're necessarily your running buddies or your little circle. To be a person who can compromise is one who can listen and then decide, okay, we differ on some things, but what are um, core principles that we, we can't yield? And the, the short list that James has, has to do with meat sacrifice to idols from blood, from um, the meat of strangled animals and illicit sexual union. You'd be well advised to avoid these things. And then he just says, farewell. Uh, it's gonna come up later in, in some of the Pauline letters that um, both in Jerusalem, you know, there was all this animal sacrifice, bulls and rams and, and birds and um, sheep and stuff. That was common throughout the Mediterranean, regardless of the religious system sacrificing animals uh, to a god or a deity of goddess was commonplace. And just about any meat that you could purchase uh, in the marketplace had already been through a ritual like that. So you might go to Safeway or your local supermarket later in the day or later in the week and buy meat without thinking at all uh, about it other than its price and does it look fresh. But in the, the first century, you might have had to consider the fact that this, uh, this meat that's now available for purchase was recently on an altar to Zeus. So 
uh, it's been offered to Zeus, but now it's it's uh, on sale <laughs> in the marketplace. So do you buy it? Um, and of course, Jews uh, didn't, uh, they didn't eat, uh, they, they didn't allow for animal strangulation. The animal had to be beheaded. The blood had to be drained out, only then could it be eaten. They, these, uh, it, it doesn't sound very important to us at all this distance, but for whatever reason, James decides these are the things that are the non-negotiables. Uh, illicit sexual union, and then all these things about meat and, and diet. Thus, they were the, the, were the representatives sent on their way back to Antioch. And upon their arrival there, they called the assembly together and, and, to, and delivered the letter because they wrote all this down and read it. When it was read, there was great delight at the encouragement it gave. Judas and Silas, Silas who were members who themselves were prophets, strengthened the community and gave them reassurance in a long discourse. After passing some time, they, they were sent back with greetings from the brothers to those who had commissioned them. Paul and Barnabas continued at Antioch, along with many others, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. So this, this is sometimes called the Council of Jerusalem. And in Roman Catholic history, uh, when I was a child, we had an official council of the church, the Second Vatican Council that ran from 1962 to 1965. Uh, there hadn't been another one since eight that Vatican I that concluded in 1871. There have been councils of the church at different times and places through its history, but people who study the councils of the church, they look to this meeting that we've just described in Jerusalem as the, the very first one of these, where the higher ups all get together with an important purpose about the direction of the future, how the mission is gonna go, who's gonna be included and on what terms. And they each bring their argumentation, they pray together, they ask the Holy Spirit's guidance and they leave with a consensus document that settles a question or at least tries to settle a question authoritatively. That's the action of a council with the Holy Spirit and all those gathered and uh, and having respectful conversation with one another that brings an outcome. So at, at verse 36, after a certain time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back now and see how the brothers are getting on in each of the towns where we had proclaimed the word of the Lord. Barnabas wanted to take along John called Mark, but Paul insisted that as Mark had deserted them at Pamphylia, refusing to join them on that mission, he was now not fit to be taken along. All right, so now we're having spats. We're having personality conflicts or uh, employee issues. You know, that's been a part of my life. Um, uh, the disagreement with, that ensued was so sharp that the two separated. Barnabas took Mark along with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul, for his part, chose Silas, a Roman, to accompany him on his journey. And in this, he was commended by the brothers to the favor of the Lord. He traveled throughout Syria and Sicilia, giving the churches their renewed assurance. So there you go. We got heroes of the church right there at the beginning saying, I don't like the looks of that one. I don't trust him. Remember that time when he did, he, he wouldn't go along or whatnot. And they, they have an argument and it doesn't come to a peaceful resolution. We just in the previous section had a, this really nice council in Jerusalem where people had out their, dis, their difficulties came to some short list of, of uh, mutual terms. There's uh, joy and peace. And then in the next, we can't even decide who we're gonna work with. And even uh, Paul, our hero in this study, just says, you can have John Mark, <laughs> I'll take Silas. We'll go over here and we'll do what we need to do. So uh, I take heart in that, that if you, you know how sometimes we wanna hearken back uh, sort of, um, I don't know, in a dreamy kind of way back to the olden days when everything was great. You know, I remember, did you, any of you, do you ever, any of you remember um, the Waltons, that long running television series during my childhood that was in rural Virginia where people were starving during the depression, but it, that was the seventies or the late seventies, I think when that show was popular it was looking back to a period where there was widespread starvation, <laughs> there was, but lots of job loss, lots of trouble all over the world, but somebody was looking back at it as a golden age and writing a whole story about it. Um, 
uh, you can you can uh, create political campaigns around the idea of things aren't as good as they used to be if only we return to the olden days and the olden ways, or you can that can happen inside the church if only we stop doing what we're doing now and do it the way we used to do it. Um, that kind of dynamic can play out in lots of different social settings. But uh, when I see that on the one hand, the church can get together in a council and work out really important stuff. And then in their next breath, be kind of petty about each other's personalities and working alongside each other. It just reminds me that whatever bad stuff I think is going on in my lifetime, well, get over it, buddy. <laughs> you can pick any time and place and imagine if you want to that that would have been the golden age if only I had been there if only I could have lived in this and that time or whatever that I think just think that's a, a fool's errand uh, anyway there we find that Paul and Barnabas are now split up but now it's going to be Paul and Silas Paul arrives first at Derba next he comes to Lystra and there was a disciple there named Timothy whose mother was Jewish and a believer, and whose father was Greek. That was the same, it was true for Paul. Since the brothers in Lystra and Iconium spoke highly of him, Paul was anxious to have him come along on the journey. Now, Paul had him circumcised because of the Jews of that region, for they all knew that it was only his father who was Greek. As they made their way from town to town, they transmitted to the people for observance the decisions which the apostles and presbyters had named in Jerusalem. So here you find another compromise that was a painful one for Timothy. He submits to being circumcised even after they have already decided that it is necessary, but even though it's not necessary, it might be prudent. Have you ever lived um, in some circumstance where you didn't really feel obligated to do a thing but it would probably be prudent to do the thing that you really don't want to do to begin with, but it would make, it would float the boat. It would help everybody get along. Okay. Laurie Hudson's nodding her head like she's been in some contentious relationship somewhere in her life. <laughs> Sometimes that you have to go along to get along. And that's what uh, Timothy does in that circumstance. They decide, even though we've just agreed that this isn't absolutely necessary, probably wouldn't be a bad idea anyhow. Right. I've made, had to make a lot of, of concessions like that in my public ministry in order to um, try to keep some semblance of unity uh, going on. Anyway, um, through all this, the congregations grew stronger in faith and they daily increased in numbers. Uh, the author of Acts of the Apostles of Luke Acts likes to have these little, uh, they're sometimes called inclusios, there are little sentences at the end of a section uh, where we'll, we'll just be told about stuff. And through all this, the congregations grew stronger in faith and daily increased in numbers. It kind of gives you a sense of, um, I'm thinking of a stock market curve and how you have your daily ups and downs. But when you pull back from this week in the stock market and you look at the last six months or year, there might be a really steady upward movement. It's just that in the short run, there's this thing going on. And part of what the author of, of Luke and Acts wants you to understand is the movement of the Holy Spirit from Jerusalem in chapter one of Luke all the way to, to Rome in chapter 28 of Acts of the Apostles. It's an upward curve, no doubt about it. The Holy Spirit is winning, if you will. The, the good news is, is moving, even though Paul and Peter are both going to be beheaded in Rome, even that is not seen as the colossal tragedy that ruins the whole thing. It's just one more, even something like the martyrdom of the leaders ends up being in this long story arc, being you know, a bump in the road. Let's stop with that for a minute. Can you even imagine that? Can you imagine something like the beheadings and the crucifixion of Paul and Peter being thought of as an unfortunate occurrence along the way as the Holy Spirit continues to um, move in time and space. That's a big one. Well, where I'm, 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 they're nowhere near their martyrdoms yet. I'm getting way ahead of the story. But uh, through all this, the congregations grow stronger in faith and daily increase in numbers, which is a nice assurance on the part of the 
author of Luke and Acts, that while we're talking about all this drama and disagreement and struggle, that there, there's also a, a character to the whole story that's sort of unaffected by that. And I don't know if you've felt that in your life. Have you ever been peaceful for what might be seen as no good reason? Have you ever been able to just kind of keep your head about you and have a certain kind of quietude and peace and assurance of all is well, even though somebody next to you would be saying, what the hell's wrong with you, Susie? <laughs> this, that, and the other just happened. Uh, don't you get it? You probably have had a moment in your life where, where you know that dynamic, where you know that, yes, I could give in to uh, frustration or anger or despair because of this, that, and the other, which you just said. But on the other hand, life is good, um, you know, uh, and, and getting better. Anyway, they next travel through Phrygia and Galatian territory because they had prevented, been prevented by the Holy Spirit from preaching the message in the province of Asia. Isn't that interesting? The, the, the Holy Spirit constrains their mission. It doesn't say how. What was it that, what was it, uh, was there some, a seer or oracle or something? Or what was it that made them think the Holy Spirit wants them to do this, do this but not that? That might've been uh, operative in your life. I know it has been in mine. There's sometimes when you're, you're trying to follow the Holy Spirit, you're trying to be the agent of um, change and good, you're trying to do things in Jesus' name and in the name of the Holy Spirit, but sometimes you just have a conviction that I need to go this way and not that way, at least right now. Anyway, that seems to be a, a occurring right there. Um, they come instead to Mysia and try to go on to Bithynia. We're getting a lot of geography today. But again, the spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow them. Crossing through Mysia, instead, they come down to Troas. There, one night, Paul had a vision. A man of Macedonia stood before him and invited him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Well, I'm a guy that has uh, night dreams <laughs> and uh, uh, sometimes directed in dreams. Anyway, Paul, it looks like, had a vision from some Macedonian guy that says, come over here and help us. So after this vision, we immediately made efforts to get across to Macedonia concluding that God had summoned us to proclaim the good news there, right? That's significant at verse 10. After this vision, we, first time that pronoun has been used. It's, uh, this is the beginning of what's called the we section because now an author is beginning to put himself in the story without identifying himself, but we went there. So, uh, most scholars assume that this is uh, the same author that wrote Luke uh, and Acts of the Apostles is now joins the story. The parts of it that have preceded are um, stories that he receives and puts into writing. But this section now also involves first person witness testimony. We went with him. We proclaim the good news there. We put out to sea from Troas and set a course straight for Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, a leading city in the district of Macedonia in a Roman colony. We spent some time in that city. Once on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the bank of the river, where we thought that we would, there would be a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women who were gathered there. One who listened was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple goods, from the town of Theatira. She had already reverenced God and the Lord opened her heart to accept what Paul was saying. After she and her household had been baptized, she extended an invitation. If you are convinced that I believe in the Lord, <clears throat> come and stay at my house. And she managed to prevail upon us. So uh, here you have a businesswoman and she's, uh, she's not dealing in just anything, but she's dealing in purple goods. Uh, the reason that we sometimes refer to purple as royal purple was because the um, 
different herbs or seeds or whatever was used to create the dyes, purple was one of the hardest colors to procure. You could, there were lots of other colors that you could dye stuff that were inexpensive to get the materials to create the dye bath that the cloth would be put in. But the materials that it took to create the color purple in a dye were rare. And that's why they were, that purple got associated with royalty because only people with a lot of money could afford to buy purple clothes. There just wasn't that much purple available. So that tells us that Lydia wasn't any just uh, low level um, merchant woman. She was dealing in high end goods. So there's probably, you know, are there any high end stores that you ever go in? Or do you, do you just know they're there and ignore them because they're expensive? Um, uh, she's, she would have probably had, uh, a, a, uh, her goods would have been sold in the finest boutiques because she's dealing in purple goods, not just any old stuff. So she's already a woman of some substance. She reverences God already. And the Lord opened her heart to accept what Paul was saying. She and her whole household were baptized. So she was a woman of sufficient influence to have a whole household who did what she did, who followed her. Okay. So that's important. Uh, in that regard, she's, uh, Jesus was, had among his followers uh, a, a, a coterie of influential women who seemed to pay for things. And Paul, uh, on, on, it looks like the first night that they even meet Lydia, is inviting them to her house she prevailed upon us and so we stayed there. It was while we were on our way out to the place of prayer, so it's a little bit of a uh, flashback, just a little bit before that, while we we're out to a place of prayer, we had met a slave girl who had a clairvoyant spirit. She used to bring substantial profit to her masters by her fortune telling. The girl began to follow Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God. They will make known to you a way of salvation. Well, so far, that sounds good. You've got this, this clairvoyant spirit that's saying, hey, everybody's kind of your press agent, saying, look over here. He's, he's, this guy's got the goods. She did this for, for several days until Paul became annoyed, turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, come out of her. And then in there, the spirit left her. So enough already, don't need your help, <laughs> come out of her, be still. When her masters saw that their source of profit was gone, <laughs> follow the money, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the main square before the local authorities. So this, this time they're not being beaten up necessarily because of theological issues, it's monetary. We don't like the look of these guys or the horse they ran it, rode in on. They're agitators, they're disturbing the peace, Furthermore, they're Jews, which means they advocate customs which are not lawful for us Romans to adopt or practice. That's always handy. Anti-Semitism, you know, you, that, it's never far away. You can always pick that up and, you know, craft that into some sort of ugly little argument. The crowd joined in the attack on them and the magistrates stripped them and ordered them to be flogged. After many lashes, they're thrown into prison and the jailer was given instructions to guard them well. Upon receipt of these instructions, he put them in maximum security, going so far as to chain their feet to a stake. So poor Paul, Silas, I don't know if Timothy was involved in this one or not, but you know, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. So now they're chained to a stake inside of the prison after being beaten. But about midnight, while Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God as their fellow prisoners listened. Don't you love that? Can you imagine having had the day they just had? Mary Jane, you've just been beaten up. You're, in, you're, you're not only in prison, but they drive a stake into the ground and tie your feet to it. And, and then you say to your companion, I know what let's do. Let's, let's have a slumber party. Let's stay up and stay up all night. Let's pray and sing out loud. Uh, and so that's what they're doing. Uh, they're not gonna be deterred. They're just, uh, they're praying and singing hymns to God as their fellow prisoners listened. Um, 
But I believe that if, if you and I are really the little solar panels God created us to be, we can soak up, soak up the Lord's goodness wherever we are, even if it's a prison in the middle of the night, and we can magnify the presence of the Lord and share it with others. Doesn't have anything to do with where you are, what's going on around you. You can just do that wherever you are, whenever you wish. And they did. And as their fellow prisoners listened, a severe <clears throat> earthquake shook the place, rocking it to its foundations. Immediately, the doors flew open and everyone's chains were pulled loose. The jailer woke up to see the prison gates open. Thinking that the prisoners had escaped, he drew his sword to kill himself. Remember, we learned earlier that when you escape from prison, the, your jailers are executed. That happened earlier in one of the previous chapters. But Paul shouted to him, don't harm yourself. We're all still here. The jailer called for a light and then rushed in and fell trembling at the feet of Paul and Silas. After a brief interval, he led them out and said, men, what must I do to be saved? And their answer was, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and all your household. They proceeded to announce the word of God to him and everyone in his house. So now they're converting jailers and jailers' families. Can't make this stuff up. At that late hour of the night, he took them in and bathed their wounds, and he and his whole household were baptized. He led them up to his house, spread a table before them, and joyfully celebrated with his whole family his newfound faith in God. I don't know if you have a story that goes anywhere near that, because that's pretty dramatic. But such a big turn of events. The person that was your jailer is now um, asking you to baptize them. And then don't go yet. We're going to have a party and come over to my house and we're going to spread a feast. So when it was day, the magistrates dispatched officers with orders to let the men go. The jailer conveyed the, this information to Paul. The magistrates have sent order that, we're, that you were to be released. Get started now. Go on your way. Paul's response was, they flogged us in, a pub, in public without even a trial. And they threw us in jail, although we are Roman citizens. Now they want to smuggle us out in secret. Not a bit of it. Let them come out, come into the prison and escort us out. <laughs> Doesn't Paul have all the nerve in the world? <laughs> he's free to go. He doesn't have to be in prison. And he's he can take, not without an escort, I don't. You go get the people that put me here. And uh, they can show me out the door. The officers reported this to the magistrates who were immediately alarmed at hearing that they were Roman citizens. Remember, very few people were. And Paul hadn't mentioned that fact when he was being beaten and stripped and chained to a post, um, that hadn't come up, but now it has. They came along and they tried to quiet them. They escorted them out with a request that they leave the city. Now they're requesting, would you please leave? <laughs> Earlier they were ordering them around and putting them in a jail cell. And now they're saying, pretty please, would you just, um, just um, walk this way and don't come back? Once outside the prison, however, the, the two first made their way to Lydia's house, where they saw and encouraged the brothers. Afterward, they departed. All right, one last little section here, because now we're getting to Thessalonica, which is where First Thessalonians is, is written, and I, I want us to, to get there and finally get into the, into the letters themselves. Well, Paul took Silas, they took the road through uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica, which is a seaport. Uh, there was a Jewish synagogue there. Following his usual custom, Paul joined the people there and conducted discussions with them about the scriptures for three Sabbaths. He explained many things, showing that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm telling you about, he's the Messiah. Some of the Jews were convinced and threw in their lot with Paul and Silas. So too did a great number of Greeks sympathetic to Judaism and numerous prominent women. That keeps coming up in the ministry of Paul, uh, numerous prominent women. It's gonna be a, a bigger deal. Um, Lydia invited them into her home. There was no mention of uh, Lydia's husband, just Lydia invited them into her home and her whole household was baptized Lydia invite, made them her house guests, welcome for a long time. In the ancient world, um, in, a, in a house of some substance, the guy, the man had almost nothing to do with it. That might be true in 
some of the some of the marriages in this little assembly uh, that uh, the guy couldn't tell you what's in the refrigerator or uh, anything in the pantry or uh, have anything to do with household stuff. It would um, that wasn't true in my household? My dad was very he, he even though they had been raised in a kind of all those gender roles. Uh, my dad didn't let us guys just skate and leave it to the girls to do household stuff. We, he also was on ships. And on Saturdays when he was home, he would treat the place like a ship. And he would assign you a sector. And you had, you know, half an hour to get everything ship shape in your sector. And then he would come around and inspect. And so that might have been the bathroom. So, or it might have been a uh, section of the garage or whatever, but it didn't matter what gender you were. You might, you might be in charge of cleaning the oven. That wasn't a woman's job. It was just something that needed to be done because it was dirty. And on a ship, it was almost all men anyway. And so men were doing what might've been considered women's work somewhere else because it was a mostly male uh, uh, milieu. Well, anyway, in the ancient world, it's important for the growth of the early church that women had very significant roles in Paul's early communities because the communities met in their houses. When you go into a woman's house and the breaking of the bread is gonna be at her table, she's naturally uh, has a place of prominence because she's the hostess. And so in the early church, it was commonplace for at least in the, in the early Pauline communities, the genuine Paul communities for uh, women to, to be more front and center and more outspoken. When we get to those later letters written 50 years later and ascribed to Paul, we're gonna see an attempt to rein that back in and women not speak and not be seen and so on and, and go back to more of those earlier, uh, more conservative customs. For right now, uh, uh, they're, where were we? They stayed behind. Paul took, went as far as Athens by escort, then returned with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join them as soon as possible. I, I skipped ahead a little bit. Um, I was at verse four. Some of the Jews were convinced and they threw in their lot with Paul and Silas, a great number of Greeks sympathetic to Judaism and numerous prominent women. So at verse five, chapter 17, five. This only aroused the resentment of the Jews, however, who engaged loafers from the public square to form a mob and start a riot in the town. They marched on the house of Jason in an attempt to bring Paul and Silas before the people's assembly. When they could not find them there, they dragged Jason himself and some of the brothers to the town magistrate shouting, these men have been creating a disturbance all over the place. Now they come here and Jason has taken them in. To a man, they disregard the emperor's decrees and they claim instead that a certain Jesus is king. In this way, they stirred up the crowd. When the town's magistrates heard of the whole story, they released Jason and the others on bail. So more trouble at Thessalonica. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas off to Berea. On their arrival, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Its members were better disposed than those in Thessalonica, and they welcomed the message with enthusiasm. Each day they studied the scriptures to see whether these things were so. Many of them came to believe, as did numerous influential Greek women and men. But when the Jews at Thessalonica learned that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea too, they ran over there to cause a commotion and stir up the crowds. The brothers sent Paul off directly on his way to the sea while Silas and Timothy stayed behind. Paul was taken as far as Athens by his escort, who then returned with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. So that gets us to, to, to Thessalonica. We see that Paul organized a church there, just as is the case with, with other places that he goes. It's really mixed bag. Some people receive the message. Some of them are Greek people who don't know the Jewish scriptures very well. Others, they've used a kind of a methodical uh, proof texting method. Here, look, remember Isaiah said this or Moses did that or whatever. They'll go methodically through Old Testament stories and say, see, they predicted and see, it's being lived out in the life of Jesus of Nazareth, who we now believe is the Christ, the Messiah. 
So you've got that strand. You've got Greek people that don't even know all those old stories, those old Jewish stories who come to believe. You have this mixed group of people. Are they welcome in the synagogue? Well, not exactly. They were sort of at the beginning, but then some of the leaders chased them out of town. Uh, so, but then in the next town over, it's all great. So that same pattern just gets being repeated again and again. But what's important for us next, because we're going to be studying First Thessalonians, is a what begins to be called a church, an ecclesia in Greek, gets established in um, Thessalonica, and it it endures. Paul was its founder. But he didn't stay there very long. He puts others in charge of it. Um, but he doesn't stand over it and see to its growth. It's not his mission. He 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 understands himself to be something more of a Johnny Appleseed. Uh, it's not his job to create one orchard and stand guard over it. He's to move from place to place and sow the seed of these different communities and then put other people, local people, in charge. And then he's going to try to do his best remotely through letters to um, mediate disputes, give in deeper instruction, uh, encouragement, uh, and, and especially to try to uh, help them think their way through specific problems that are located in that particular community. So when we get into, into Paul's letters where we, we are ready to now, um, they're going to be problem driven. In my life as a priest, I don't know what your workplace has been like or your career. Would you say that in your workplace, your career, that whoever's in charge of things, that their agenda is problem driven? Have you ever been in a workplace where the person in charge, the things that they have to do that day, some of them are part of a plan, but others are them, others uh, more like putting out fires, resolving disputes. Um, uh, you know that old phrase, the um, squeaky wheel gets the grease. I, I have felt like much of my life that I was a very quiet little wheel. I haven't demanded very much attention from provincials or bishops because of something going on in the community that I was in charge of. Um, most of the time they were left free to deal with the squeak somewhere else. And I tried to see to it that way. <laughs> I didn't particularly want to have bishops or provincials or anybody else necessarily coming around and saying, what's this I hear about this? If you can resolve troubles at the local level, you don't have to go up to the level above it. But Paul, as he begins to move from place to place and have a number of different churches that he has helped bring into existence, he's the founder of them. And so he's an authoritative voice, maybe not the only one, but it's certainly an important one. And the letters that we're studying now as we're, we're pretty much finished with Acts of the Apostles for a little while, going into the letters themselves, they're gonna largely be problem driven. At least some of them like uh, First Corinthians, I mean, uh, First Thessalonians will be. All right, um, Sammy, would you get ready to send us into uh, groups? But before we do, um, I'd like to uh, ask you to unmute yourself unless you know that there's uh, you're in a noisy room. And before we go into groups, uh, I just want to give an opportunity for any question or comment. Anybody have a question or comment that you think is uh, important for us to hear? Yeah. I do. Okay. Nobody? I have a question. Claire, Claire Hamlet. Yeah. Hi, Claire. Um, <clears throat> I am confused by why God and the Holy Spirit would be so loud with teaching the people before when they enter into them. And I'm begging for a, loud, a thunder strike to come in. And I get subtle feelings that the Holy Spirit is speaking to me, but never do I see or hear a blast. Well, you must be doing it wrong. 
Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> I don't know, Claire. Yeah, you would like uh, you would like an oracle. <laughs> you know? I wouldn't mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm with you, sister. Uh, <laughs> well, it's in, in these stories. Remember, they're very condensed uh, narratives. You might take things that are happening over weeks and months and years and turning them into a story that's a couple of paragraphs long. That's the okay. nature of storytelling. Uh, okay. And we don't tend to, when we're doing rather condensed storytelling, we don't talk about what we have for dinner or uh, doing our laundry or um, a normal day at work. We, we usually talk about extraordinary uh, uh, events and, and moments when we're telling a condensed story. So uh, I would imagine if we were speaking first person to the, any of the principal characters in, the, in what we just read, that they would say, well, yeah, once in a great while, the Holy Spirit would do something that was just audacious and bold and loud, and <laughs> we'd all have to kind of agree to. But a lot of the times we just muddled along. We just, we just live very much like Claire does, you know, uh, trying to say our prayers, trying to be still, trying to read uh, the currents. Um, that's all I got, Claire. I don't have anything better for you. Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> Uh, one, one of the ways I think of that, Claire, is um, you know the Lord taught us how to pray for our daily bread, mm -hmm. uh, and not ask for a loaf or a bakery, you know, or even a Costco-sized loaf of bread, just yeah. just, <laughs> just your daily bread. Uh, yeah. uh, I think part of what that does is is create a sense of ongoing reliance. Um, if I know that I need the Holy Spirit's guidance from moment to moment to moment, it makes me more habitually attentive. It, it gets me in a habit of saying, I know that in order for me to hear you, I'm going to have to be still. And that means I need to put this down. I need to turn that off. I need to devote myself to um, going deeper. And that's all good stuff, Claire. Thank you. It is. Uh, sure. Somebody else? All right, here's the, the, uh, the idea that I'd like us to discuss in our groups. In the sections that we've gone through today, you do see the activity of the Holy Spirit moving, changing hearts, drawing together very different kinds of people um, with, a, with a positive upward trajectory. No question about it. But you also see that some of the places where you would have expected that the message would be welcomed and received, not only was it not, but it was opposed even violently. Um, in your life, how do you deal with um, acceptance, rejection, and a sense of... Um, trying to do what I believe God has put me here to do and doing what's right. How do you deal with all of that? How do you deal with the mixed results of just being you? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't have that in the form of a terse question, but do you get the, the gist of it? How do you deal with the uh, messiness, the muddiness uh, of the roller coaster, but also, um, ride the wave how do you be free in the holy spirit and not too concerned by all of the negativity or the conflict and and what is it that inspires you that helps you rise above uh, whatever might drag you down okay i'm gonna leave that with you and ask sammy that you give us um about a 20 minute time together and then um Sammy, are you doing three or four in a group? Uh, three. Okay. So you each have then what, you know, about roughly seven minutes a piece uh, to consider that. Okay. Ready, set, go. Okay. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have a, about a, like a, a bonus 20 minutes or so. I'm going to uh, send us into Thessalonica and uh, this time I mean what I'm saying, and I want you to do this, so pay attention. Uh, I would like it if between now and uh, Tuesday's session, if you would start reading in First Thessalonians. Um, 
the uh, so I'm going to give you a little background on it as you go into it. We we at least have the storyline uh, that we read earlier today about Thessalonia and encountering trouble there and moving over to the next town and having a little bit more success. But again, First Thessalonians is of all the New Testament documents, we think it's the first one written. So that gives it some primacy. It's, it's way earlier than any of the gospels in written form. It's probably written around 51. We don't have a gospel until somewhere about 20 years later, Mark's gospel and Luke and Matthew, older than that, maybe around 85 and John, maybe all the way to the end of the century. So, um, you know how sometimes uh, the, the fact that a thing is older makes it more precious. Uh, this is the earliest thing that we have in writing that uh, that is now bound into our New Testament. Uh, Thessalonica was a large seaport. It's at the northwestern tip of the Aegean Sea. It was a free city in that it didn't have a Roman garrison policing it. The people had the freedom to police their own city. It was not every everybody did. It was the second largest city in Greece. So it's other than Athens, it's a big deal. Uh, it was on a, a main trade route. Lots of Jews lived there and they had their own synagogue. Um, Paul probably stayed there about three months getting that little community established as was the case in other places. They received the same message, but it was received in different ways by different people, including among those who did receive it. Some were ethnically Jewish all their life who came to believe Paul's message that this is the Messiah, this Jesus is the Messiah. Um, some were Gentile converts to Jerusalem, to Judaism, the God-fearers that were already hanging around the synagogue. And then there were people completely unrelated to the synagogue that were um, pagan Gentiles, you might call them. They all, so Paul gathers together this group of people that normally wouldn't have had much to do with each other at all. Um, and they begin, they, they're a, a little initial church, and the Greek word is ecclesia. But they are forced by some of, of uh, the members of the synagogue who were antagonistic toward the message. They were forced to flee, leave the city. As you know, they went over to the next town, over to Berea. They had a pretty good reception there. But then some of the people who opposed them in Thessalonica followed them to try to prevent them from what they were doing in the next town over. Um, let's see. Mostly in the letter that we'll read, Paul is concerned about some of his uh, new converts. And one of the issues for them had to do with sexual chastity. Um, one sexual partner um, having, um, I don't know, kind of a sense of uh, wholeness about their body and about the use of their sexuality. That was just uncommon in the whole place. And so it was already putting them at odds. The Jews had, uh, you know, a codified code of morals that pertained to marriage and sexuality and so on. Um, and that was more direct and clear than most of what went on in the, in the Greek world around them. Uh, so that, that sort of set them apart. Um, there was in, in the letter of first Thessalonians, Paul, of course, is at a distance, which is why he's writing a letter. Uh, the, his community in Thessalonica know that he's been maltreated, even when he was with them and they're worried for his safety with good reason. So there's some anxiety, uh, from them to Paul and back the other way. He also knows that they're living in a kind of forbidding environment and he's trying to encourage them and hoping that, uh, they're safe. Um, one issue that, that uh, will come up that we haven't really dealt with before was the idea that Jesus died and was risen and that he would come again in some definitive way, that there'd be a second coming of Christ that would somehow uh, wrap everything up in a bow or um, set things right somehow and that it was imminent. 
that, um, that not only are we following this new way, but we have to be on guard and alert because something is, is gonna be happening any minute now that's gonna involve a second coming of Christ that's going to upset the order of things and somehow set things right. That was a prevalent idea. And that's gonna have some consequences even some people are not bothering to plant fields because what's why bother if Jesus is coming back any minute? <laughs> why do I want to go to all that trouble? Um, people were um, were uh, just make not making plans for things, so that he has to deal with that kind of uh, confusion around that. Some are concerned that there's they think there's there's this strand of preaching they've been exposed to that Jesus is going to come back. And he's going to take all of his beloved with him and just swoop them up. Um, but then somebody you love has died. What happens to them? So there's these questions about the afterlife uh, that enter into the imagination of the people. Paul's going to have to, as a pastor, reassure them that, well, how, you know, it's a mystery how all this is going to work, but surely the Lord's not going to leave behind people who accidentally died before his second coming. That's going to be an issue. Um, uh, he's going to be encouraging, correcting, consoling, but the letter that, that is was not a private correspondence. It's to be read in public. So I'm going to get us started with it since we have the time. So I'm I'm reading First Thessalonians is only what five, yeah, five chapters long. It's not a long letter. Remember, you would be a member of a of a a church sitting together. Somebody has a scroll and says. We've got news from Paul. All of you love Paul because you have your own stories of how you met him, uh, how um, his preaching uh, was persuasive to you. Anyway, here's the letter. <clears throat> Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be with you. We keep thanking God for all of you, and we remember you in our prayers. For we constantly are mindful before our God and Father of the way that you're proving your faith, laboring in love, and showing constancy of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we were talking about in our little group, kind of constancy of hope in the midst. Of, in our little group, we were talking about mask mandates at a school and people being ugly and cruel to each other at school board meetings and stuff over, uh, you know, this isn't just something idly in the news, it's affecting real people just trying to do their jobs, just trying to keep schools safe, just trying to, you know, create some order and then having others come in and um, call them Nazis and, and so on. Uh, uh, he's just, he's mindful before our God and Father, the ways that you're proving your faith, laboring and love, showing constancy of hope just going about your business and doing the best you can and being hopeful. We know too, uh, brothers beloved of God, how you were chosen. Our preaching of the gospel proved not a mere matter of words for you, but one of power. It was carried on in the Holy Spirit and out of complete conviction. You know as well as we do what we proved to be like when still among you, we acted on your behalf. You in turn became imitators of us and of the Lord, receiving the word despite great trials with the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. Thus, you became a model for all the believers of Macedonia and Achaia. The word of the Lord has echoed forth from you resoundingly. Can you hear kind of the kind of pride of a parent here? You know? Uh, a paternalism in the best sense of the word, a, a, a loving filial sense of, of I'm proud of you. This is true not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but throughout every region, your faith in God is celebrated, which makes it needless for us to say anything more. The people of those parts are reporting what kind of reception we had from you and how you turned to God from idols to serve him who is the living and true God and to await from heaven the son he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. So again, this is being written to a whole group of people, but he's praising the whole community at once. 
you know well enough, brothers, that our coming among you was, with not, was not without effect. Fresh from the humiliation that we had suffered at Philippi, about which you know, we drew courage from our God to preach his good tidings to you in the face of great opposition. The exhortation we deliver doesn't spring from deceit or impure motives or any kind of trickery. Rather, having met the test imposed on us by God as men entrusted with the good tidings, we speak like those who strive to please God, the tester of our hearts, rather than men. We've tried to stay single focused. We're just trying to do what the Holy Spirit of God has given us to do. We were not guilty, as you well know, of flattering words or greed under any pretext, as God is our witness. Neither did we seek glory from men, from you, or for anybody else, even though we could have insisted on our own importance as apostles of Christ. On the contrary, while we were among you, we were as gentle as any nursing, nursing mother fondling her little ones. A sweet way of Paul describing himself. <laughs> My companions and I, we were just like nursing mothers. So well disposed were we to you, in fact, that we wanted to share with you not only God's tidings, but our very lives. So dear had you become to us. You must recall our efforts and our toil how we work day and night all the time we preach God's good tidings to you in order not to impose on you in any way. You are witnesses, as is God himself, of how upright, just, and irreproachable our conduct toward you, was toward you who are believers. You know how we exhorted every one of you as a father does his children, how we encouraged and pleaded with you to make your lives worthy of the God who calls you to his kingship and glory. That's why we thank God constantly that in receiving his message from us, you took it not as the word of men, but as it truly is, the work of God, the word of God at work within you who believe. In the background, there were other people that moved about with different kind of religious messages. Remember that this was a polytheistic area. So there were lots of different ways of thinking about God and gods and goddesses and how one ought to uh, observe you know, uh, religious and spiritual practice. Uh, so it's not as though they had never seen somebody come to town with a new religious idea. But one of the things that they were accustomed to was there, there was this prevalent idea among itinerant religious preachers that, um, that if they were good at what they did, they would be paid well for it financially kind of a sign of, uh, of approval being um, the ability to take up big collections and have people give you a lot of money because you were really good, a really good preacher. I mean, that idea never really goes away. You know, that I, the prosperity gospel. And um, Paul was a, uh, he, his, he learned an expertise in addition to all that scholarship that he did as a young man, he learned leather craft and he learned tent making. And he didn't allow himself to be fully paid uh, religious spokesperson or evangelist. He, wor he worked with his hands to bring in the income that he needed to support himself. And he thought he was doing that to, um, to make it clear that he was at the service of the gospel and not profiting by it. But then some of his critics came behind him and said, essentially, if he was really any good at what he's, he, he's doing, uh, he'd be collecting lots of money. And instead, he's just this simple tent maker guy. Remember, too, that Paul was not one of the original 12 apostles, and people, critics, reminded people of that. He wasn't one of the 12. He didn't know Jesus to begin with. Uh, he's not really an apostle. And there were other people who were, um, who sometimes Paul would call super apostles, people that uh, that felt like, like they had the apostolic pedigree and he didn't. So sometimes he had to kind of take up for himself that he was working quietly and uh, just at the service of them. Brothers, you've been made like children, that you've been made like the churches of God in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered the same treatment from your fellow countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed Jesus, the Lord Jesus and the prophets and who persecuted us. 
displeasing to God and hostile to all people, they try to keep us from preaching salvation to the Gentiles. But all this time, they've been filling up their quota of sins, but the wrath has descended upon them at last. Brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by separation from you for a time, in sight, not in mind, we were seized with the greatest longing to see you. So we tried to come to you. I, Paul, tried to come more than once, but Satan blocked the way. Who, after all, if not you, will be our hope or our joy or the, or the crown we exult in before our Lord Jesus Christ is coming, because you are our boast and our delight. Well, we're near the top of the hour. I'm not going to get into the Satan part and the wrath that is to come with two minutes left in the session, but I'll circle back around to that. But between now and Tuesday, if you can join us on Tuesday, please read the whole of First Thessalonians because it, um, in my Bible, it's only one, two, three pages, not really more like two. It's not a long document. But as I, as I mentioned, it's especially precious to us because it's the first thing, the oldest thing that we have in, its, in Paul's own hand. So uh, as always, remember, if you know of somebody you think would enjoy being part of this study, all of it's been posted to YouTube and this will be posted very soon. So there's not that much to catch up on if a person wanted to uh, join in. So um, with that, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Love you. See you next time. Love you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.